Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everyone. Welcome to your podcast, New Books in Economic and Business History. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure to be with Chris Blattman. Chris is professor in the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And he's the author of a recently published book called Why We Fight, The Roots of War and the Paths to Peace. We're going to be talking with Chris about the book and his career today. Thank you, Chris, for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Let me ask you a first question that, uh, I mean, I ask this to all my guests, but um, in your case, I'm particularly curious about um, some pieces of information that you reveal in the book um, regarding your life and your career, right? So I would like to hear how you ended up becoming a scholar um, and feel free to start as early in your life as you want. But um, I would like to uh, hear from you the story about how you ended up interested in conflict, right? So it seems that you were a a young PhD in economics and uh, there's a Beautiful love story behind that. So please tell us uh, a bit about that. Sure. I, for a long time, I thought I wanted to work in economic development as a policymaker. And I went to do, a, I didn't know how to do that. I was working in, in sort of business in Canada, and very disillusioned with that in my 20s. So I entered a international development program that had just begun at Harvard Kennedy School and thinking that would be a springboard to a policy career. When I ended up doing research for some faculty, initially it was some field microeconomic research in India, which I just found fascinating. I started working with an economic historian as well on sort of long run development. Super, I, I just got super fascinated in that. And so I decided to go for a PhD and was accepted at Berkeley and really nowhere else actually. And and only because I think Brad DeLong was in charge of admissions that year. And anyone know who's Brad, Brad has sort of like eclectic tastes. And, and so this weird sort of person who, who was sort of part economic historian of development and didn't really have much math or a very conventional CV he actually led into the program. Otherwise, nobody really let me in. Um, so thank you. Thank you to Brad. Uh, and and then I, I started working with various economists, including Ted Miguel. And I was really interested in industrial development. Uh, I kind of thought, as I do now, that development is not really about helping, uh, you know, somebody start a microenterprise or get a cow I think the development is going to happen when countries industrialize. And, and so I got myself a summer internship working for the World Bank in Kenya on a firm survey. And, and, and that was going to be my path to maybe working on industrial development. And, uh, uh, and then as I talk about in the prologue to the book, that my, my laptop was stolen by some enterprising con men. It stuck me in an internet cafe where back in 2004, we were still using Hotmail and Kenya wasn't on the international internet cable. So it took like 10 minutes for every email to load. So the normal, the social norm was to just chat to the people next to you. And uh, the woman sitting next to me turns out was a humanitarian and a researcher working in Northern Uganda with former child soldiers. And, And that was totally fascinating to me. And, and so it took, you know, we actually had a had a brief romantic fling and then drifted apart. And it was only like a year later or six, maybe eight or nine months later when I was, I'd been working on this sort of dissertation idea that was failing and struggling. Well, it was struggling. And I was seeking help from a, another professor who, uh, who, who, what, what I should do. And, and a guy named McCartan Humphreys, who had actually 
worked with some ex-combatants in Sierra Leone and was running, that was sort of his new research weekend. I said, oh, you know, I met this person. You should, you should, you should meet this person because they're, you guys are doing similar research. And he said, oh, that's fascinating. He asked me all these questions. And I walked out of his office thinking that is fascinating. And so I phoned up this woman I hadn't talked to in months. And I said, tell me again more about Northern Uganda. And we began talking and we just hatched this program to like scale up and quantify and do statistically what she was already doing quantitatively. And and, and three months later, I was on a plane. Um, and not before my dissertation committee actually said, what? This is crazy. Do not go to northern Uganda about two weeks before my flight left. So um, so that so, but I'd already purchased the flight. And 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 so there I was. Uh, but anyways, that totally changed my mind and everything. Industrialization sort of is important, but it kind of faded in importance. And that like launched me on this career in violence. And as I mentioned in the book, and I think we've now been married uh, 14, 14 years. We have two kids, lots of research papers together. So it was a good decision. I mean, it's a fascinating story. Just the idea that your career, I mean, at the end of the day, shaped by like a lot of like luck and I guess, I don't know, serendipity. Even when you describe the role of Brad, who, by the way, I'm going to interview soon for his latest book, this publishing. Uh, in a yeah, fabulous months. book. Uh, yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, but yeah, like the, just the existence of some people appearing in your life at like the particular time seems very important. I can relate a lot with that as I've had a, a sort of tumultuous or not very linear um, career either. But that, I, I want to ask you something. Well, I would more. say, I mean, I think, you know, that's how most academic careers, maybe most careers happen. It's super idiosyncratic what you work on. And individuals, individual people can play a really big role at that like critical juncture and set you, you off in a different direction. Do you think that, because I have the impression that academia, <clears throat> at least in, in economics, but I, I have the impression that this is the case in other disciplines, gives the impression to young scholars that there is a very specific path that must be followed and that there are not many... Uh, variants possible. So I feel that people have the pressure to, well, go to very specific departments to do their PhDs. And then the job market is this crucial event that is going to define your career forever. Do you feel that, I mean, I get the impression based on what you said, that you agree with the idea that there are many ways to build a career that it's full of like uh, idiosyncratic features. Do you think that in your role as a mentor, do you feel the need to express that to your students? Or, I mean, how do you deal with that? Well, I, I will say economics is maybe, my, my guess is it's maybe the most hierarchical and conformist social science or maybe science, period. Uh, I'm not sure that's, I don't know. I'm not sure that's a good thing. I don't know for sure. We'll find out. It's a big experiment we're running as a discipline with no control group. Uh, the, but even within that conformism, um, the thing that a grad student, I think eventually ends up running with as their dissertation is very idiosyncratic. And I think the job market is a moment to be reminded of just how idiosyncratic outcomes can be. Um, and individuals, a single individual in a department who simply happens to stumble across your work and be passionate about it and advocate for it can be the difference between, you know, where you spend the next 10 years of your life and not. So, so I think it's still true, but I, I agree. I think conformism means that people are entering the PhD program with more homogeneity than probably in the past and probably in other disciplines. Um, let me ask you something about like, the paths that you didn't take in, in your career. So you weren't seem to be directing to be an economic historian. Um, and you took a different path. However, and that's actually the reason why I wanted to interview you because the, your book is pretty much a history book in a, in a certain way. Um, and I remember seeing on Twitter, some people giving you a hard time describing how it was somewhat naive or something to try to explain like modern conflicts looking at the past, right? But like as someone that does economic history, I think that that's probably the most obvious way to think about reality, right? Looking at the past. So 
my question is how much do you think that your initial training or um, interest in economic history is present in your in your research today um, is it do you think that it played any role has any influence in the way you approach questions do you still have questions that you want to address are you going to write a paper on ancient Greece and conflict there uh, tell me a bit about that well um, interesting I mean history is one of the sources I mined for evidence I tried in some ways to sort of make this a synthetic book of everything and so it's the game theory it's the modern RCTs it's the it's the contemporary case studies and it's the histories as well and so um, the thing is is so much of empirical economics has been a theoretical on the subject of conflict it's just been this hyper empirical it, it sort of ignored and abandoned the core theoretical apparatus we have for understanding violence um, at any level that necessarily a lot of the more persuasive evidence is coming from comparative comparative politics and from international relations and from history, which is very qualitative and case-based and sometimes historical. So, so I hope that changes and I think it's already changing. Um, but, uh, but, but I think that was, that was, I was compelled. And then, you know, I think maybe I was able to do it more skillfully than otherwise, simply because I'd had some training in economic history and, and, uh, and, and had taught a lot of economic history, especially as a TA, like for years and years, I taught economic history classes, which, which is just a good way of teaching yourself history. Right. And so I wasn't dipping into these literatures completely naive. I think about, you know, I, I felt there were lots of, I actually felt m more out of my depth in the game theory parts of what I was doing than in the historical and international relations kind of part of what I was doing. So, so, and I, I kind of had to try to master all of them. Right, right, right. Let's, let's get into the book then now. So, I mean, you start the book by describing how in a certain way, war is, um, is an anomaly, um, which, uh, Although seems like quite accurate once you say it, it's not obvious at all. And it reminded me my young days as a undergrad when I had a very good uh, professor of economic history, of uh, history of economic thought. And he was telling us how our entire discipline departed from the invisible hand and the idea that we could coordinate um, in a decentralized way uh, and create a very harmonious society. And I remember spending several weeks thinking about how that was a wrong theory. I was very young and I guess um, naive trying to criticize this. And I felt like, you know, there's a lot of conflict around. There's people that want to take things from you. And they're like people robbing other people like all the time. Like, how, how is this a good theory of the world? And I remember asking this professor that and he told me like, you're right. But the point is that that's not the basis of the system. Right. So for every person robbing another person, there are hundreds of thousands just producing goods. And that's that's the, the, the system working. Right. So there's a theory of the entire system. And that for me was quite insightful. And and that claim with which you begin the conversation plays a bit that role. Um, and I don't know how frequently do you have to bring that up. Um, and in particular, in this context in which. Well, there's so much pessimism um, in, in the world, but um, so tell me that, like, how important do you think that it is to recognize that war is an anomaly? And let's, let's start discussing what are the arguments that you have in the book. Why is it an anomaly? Why don't we have more prevalent conflict? Are we better? Like, are we good people, or is there just like a handful of bad apples that are creating conflict, and there are just not yeah. that many? So. I mean, economists would probably call, you know, call this the Coase theorem, but I think it's it's a little bit more ancient and elementary than that. It's just the idea that um, you know, bargaining through bloodshed is just, in some sense, the co most costly and inefficient way to to settle our differences. And and so it's it's less an anomaly than it is a last resort, or 
or it's only something we do and we overlook these ridiculous costs, these ruinous costs of that route. Um, and, and so, and so, you know, I didn't write a book called why we don't fight. You know, I wrote a book called why we fight. Cause we do, I don't want to overemphasize the idea that we don't fight, but, um, you know, in nowadays, you know, a lot of people, this seems a strange moment for this message, especially with the war in Ukraine and on everyone's minds. What I like to point out, I like to point out a couple of things. One is just that, you know, two weeks into that invasion, India launched a cruise missile at Pakistan by accident and common suit as it has for decades. And the, the, the conflict between Israel, between, between, oh, sorry, India and Pakistan has been occasionally spiked, right? But generally brief and lower scale. Um, Israel, Palestine is another example. This is a dispute that has been going on for a hundred years. Um, and, Depending on how you know whatever you know, the, the 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 high violence years are maybe you know fifteen or twenty of those, and that now that's serious. I don't want so that's not that's why I said it's not so much an anomaly. But let's point out actually that that actually the, the that violence is somewhat an anomalous, and that in most years, you know, enemies have preser- have preferred to loathe in peace. Um, and, and even this is even true of Vladimir Putin, who for 20 years tried every other tool imaginable to co-opt Ukraine until eventually invasion was his last resort. And so, so this these these terrible you know we do bargain through bloodshed, uh, but but we often try to do everything else possible. And because the costs of war just just have this gravitational pull on us. Okay, so you're right so the book is not called why we don't fight it's called why we fight and you bring five sort of uh what do you call roots uh here what what are those five roots yeah so you know it's basically a lens to look at conflict and and, and for me i'm actually trying to sort of say like so many reasons for war I'm, i want to give people an organizing framework and to point out that almost one organizing framework to look at it is almost every explanation of war can be thought of as a reason that a society or its leaders ignored the costs and opted for this inefficient thing called fighting. And uh, and and some of them are familiar to economists and we don't talk about them enough. And I think some of them are part of, are familiar to psychology and far, familiar to outside, or to the average person and economists don't talk about them enough. Um, you know, the first one I point out is I call, I call it unchecked leaders or unaccountable leaders. Basically, if the people deciding to go to war aren't accountable for those costs, then why would they pay attention to them? Um, and so in economics, this is just an agency problem, right? And, 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 and so a leader can take their group to war either. They'll, they'll, they'll basically will be too ready to use violence, but they may also have a private incentive if clinging on to power. So, for example, Vladimir Putin is a personalized dictator. He doesn't bear all the costs of war. He bears some. So he should still not want to fight. But if he has some private incentive, if he thinks that he can hold on to power through invading Ukraine, potentially because it exterminates the sort of democratic example on his doorstep, then then that, that might get us a lot of the way towards understanding an invasion like this. Uh, the second I talk about I, is sort of a... We could think of a sort of intangible or early logical incentives, incentives for warfare. Um, you hear these stories in this current conflict, you know, Russia pursuing, you know, national glory or Putin pursuing personal glory. So that's some payoff that he can only, he's willing, he knows there's a cost of war. He doesn't bear all of them. He's willing to pay the cost he bears for this intangible thing. Uh, so that's what economists would just call non-standard preferences. There's nothing irrational about this. What we value is what we value. That's Putin's utility function. Or so will people say, who really knows what his utility function is? But if that's his utility function, he's maximizing. And he's he's decided to pursue this, this objective in spite of the costs. Likewise, Ukrainians are refusing to make a pragmatic compromise uh, out of a equally ideological commitment to liberty. And to not this sort of being semi-sovereign, having this sort of semi-sovereign political subjugation to Russia. Um, so it, that too is a sort of a non-standard preference. Uh, it's one that, you know, I find much more noble than personal glory and national glory. And so I'm sympathetic to the Ukrainians and I won't tell them not to fight because of that. But it's, but that's, that's, I think, a big part of the story. Um, 
The third and the fourth are much more familiar. You know, if, if this is an audience of economists, they'd think of them as information asymmetries and commitment problems and what's called the sort of classic rationalist reasons for bargainings breaking down. In the book, I, I call it uncertainty rather than information asymmetries for, I think, an important reason. One is just that we don't even need there to be differential information or one-sided private information for there to be a conflict. That's like a special case, an important special case of uncertainty. I think just amidst the general uncertainty, you know, any any action you take as a as a country is a gamble. So it was extraordinarily uncertain how um, how how strong Russia's military would be, how resolved Ukraine would be, how united the West would be. And so amidst that uncertainty, I think Putin was was gambled and he, he lost. Uh, he got a bad draw on all those three things, which nobody least well him predicted. Uh, amidst that, he also couldn't really believe a lot of the West's and Ukrainian protestations that they were quite resolved because he's this because that's private information and they might have been bluffing. Um, I'll leap past commitment problems for a moment just to talk about misperceptions, which is the what you know all of the mistakes we make as individuals. People are very quick to blame uh, this invasion on maybe more institutional mistakes and, and, and biased information that Putin's an isolated, insulated autocrat who's systematically punished truth tellers. And, and so he's getting bad information. And so it's not just that this was uncertain, but that he, he made this decision with, he underestimated the costs and overestimated his chances of victory. That seems totally plausible to me. Um, and then there's this idea of commitment problems, which is just the idea that neither side trusts the other side to be able to hold to a deal, that they can each see how either side has incentives or their hands tied and is unable, unable to, unable to um, you know, agree to a peace agreement. So Russia doesn't trust Ukraine to agree to neutrality because it thinks that any leader that does so will be tossed out by an ideological public. And then no one trusts Putin to hold on to... Uh, to basically agree to a settlement because they think he's driven by these ideological commitments. So they, the, what's interesting is the, the main commitment problems in this situation are not driven by, I think, actual power dynamics shifting, but I think by our beliefs about the ideological commitments of the other side, which is, I think, maybe the least studied kind of commitment problem in economics and political science, but really, really important. Right. So now that you're mentioning the... I mean, the emergence of war as uh, a challenge to agree on peace. You also th want to talk in the book about peace, right? So part of the title of the book is um, The Paths to Peace, right? Um, and you mentioned some ways to get to peace. What, what, what are those ways, right? If unfortunately a society is already in a conflict, how do they get to peace? Right. Well, um So each of these five reasons was a reason to ignore, overlook, or be willing to pay the costs of war and take this inefficient path. And so every, every I think, solution we have to peace is something that attacks at least one of those five. Um, it has to be the right one of those and that because every, every conflict is different, right? I like to use a medical analogy where if you're a doctor – and somebody shows up on your ward with all of these symptoms, it's actually, you, 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 there, there's a, any number of things that could be wrong with them. And so part of the path to peace is figuring out, is, is having the right diagnosis. Um, and, and, the, and, and, so, and every diagnosis is going to be different. It's probably going to be an interaction of some, 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 Um, you know, a whole bunch of different factors. And so that's true in most of the situations. So the starting path to peace is actually in each situation, sort of thinking through these five logics and all of the subcategories, you know, like there's lots of, that, that, these are just sort of ways to classify different reasons. But within that sort of like disease, you can have lots of different viruses and you can have lots of different sort of Uh, uh, heart problems and lots of different, you know, so it's, they're, they're, you're still never quite sure what's going on. Um, but then in the book, I talk about how there's the, the, what a lot of the solutions to peace look is, is one is just making 
people more cognizant of the costs to the other side and more and internalizing those. So basically internalizing the externalities. So it's basically making us more inter interdependent, economic intertwining, social intertwining, ideological intertwining, uh, is a way of, of actually making us making more more costly because we care about the other side's costs, which in the basic game we don't care about. Uh, it's about having really clear, predictable rules and consequences set by formal and informal institutions that actually punish people for being unchecked for their ideological incentives for their misperceptions and that reduce uncertainty and help parties hold, you know, solve commitment problems and hold them for a deal towards a deal. And then I think it's about internal political organization and having more checks and balances, because not only does having more checks and balances mean you are, you fewer unchecked leaders, which was our first problem, but actually over centralized power is driving all five of these causes of war. Our leaders, yes, obviously mechanically, our leaders, unchecked leaders are ignoring costs, pursuing private benefits, but I think we're then vulnerable to their ideological incentives. I think they, they structurally, I think autocrats and personalized power have, have more misperceptions institutionally. They get bad, bad information. I think they create a lot of uncertainty because it's, they can be unpredictable. And then by definition, dictators can't make credible commitments. And so they sort of just, innumerable commitment problems flow from dealing with autocrats. And so, uh, so, so a big part of, I think the solution is checks and balances. So that's sort of the, and so I have sort of three chapters where I walk through this interdependence, these rules and in, in, in enforcement and checks and balances as sort of the long-term fundamentals about how some societies have become less warlike. So in this, I mean, in this, you're, try to provide this general framework to think about war, right? And that's um, intended to be useful to interpret both large-scale large scale wars between countries, but also, and you've mentioned quite a bit here, the, the case of Ukraine and Russia. Uh, but in the book, you talk about your research in Colombia, for instance, which I'm going to ask you a bit more later, um, and which is conflict between groups, right? Private groups. Um, how different are those type of, uh, of conflicts and what type of particularities do you think that each of those the service, is, is it irrelevant? Does it matter if you're talking about a nation state or, or a band? Does it matter the size of the group? Uh, how do you think about that and how does your, your framework f like fits into like that element? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, th this is what makes some, uh, I think, a, I think a small number, but I think this is what has made some academics mad because we, we spend all of our time specializing and we decide, well, if we're going to make progress on understanding conflict, we need to, you know, not only do I, is gang warfare distinct from civil wars, but, you know, gang warfare in Chicago is really different than gang warfare in Latin America. We should be specializing by region. Um, because these are really distinct phenomenon. And, and then international warfare is a whole other beat because the conditions are different. There's anarchy, there isn't an overarching state. And, and all of that's true. And I too have made my career by specialization, right? That's Smithian specialization. That's how we make progress. Um, but we, I don't think as a, I don't think as a, as a social science, we should be doing a hundred percent specialization and 0% generalization. That's the bad trade-off. So I think we do need to step back and sort of ask what all of these things have in common and learn from them. I certainly was like, I think I learned a lot of like a lot of how I, a lot of the strategies that I'm interested in pursuing and see as promising in terms of combating gang warfare come from looking at international conflict. And it's the specialization and the siloization that I think has made us bad at at combating certain kinds of war. So for example, if you were working in Africa on civil conflicts and you have two, we have a bunch of rebel armed groups. The first thing you would do is try to seek mediated agreements between these groups, right? You would try to actually have groups seek sign peace agreements and they're through formal processes with mediators, just like, because, and they're in super, it's very, very effective. I mean, it's not a magic bullet, but it's really helpful. Um, 
nobody does that with in gangs in Chicago. Nobody's saying let's sit these groups down together and create some very clear peace agreements and some clear consequences and violations. And let's have some formal mediators and bring their skills to bear. It happens a little bit, but it kind of happens in an ad hoc way. So I, I think like the absence of generalization has blinded us to some solutions, for example. Um, but, but, but this is a book for a general audience where I think generalization is even more important and the general lessons to sort of see conflict and the similar, what, what they hold in common at all these levels is, is maybe more educational than a book that just focuses on why they're so different. That's super interesting. Actually, let me ask you something about that and trying to connect that then with your research on, on Colombia, which by the way, like one of your authors, a very good friend of mine, and I follow a bit like the evolution of, uh, of the project. And I think it's, it's fascinating in, in many ways. Um, and most of that, and I mean, by that, your research focuses on gang violence, but Colombia is an interesting place in the sense that there's violence at many different levels, right? And something that I always found very, um, I don't know if I've called that surprising, but um, um, somewhat, somewhat typical was that when uh, the government was Uh, in peace talks with the FARC, which is one or was one of the uh, guerrilla groups, probably the most important guerrilla group in, in Colombia, the way in which they would uh, publicize the, the agreements was as a general claim of we're reaching peace, right? And I always found that weird in the sense that that was one dimension of the violence that the country was experiencing. And it was not even the entire part of the conflict between the government and rebel groups, right? There were several other rebel groups, right? And you could add to that all the gang violence and, and so on, right? Um, so I want to ask you a bit about your general perception of conflict in Colombia. What have you learned about your experience working here? I know you've been here on the ground talking to people, talking to gang members, talking to Uh, policymakers. Is Colombia different in a certain way? Uh, is sour violence a typical? Is there any relevant connection that we have ignored between these different levels of, of conflict? Um, how do you think about Colombia? Well, there's several, as you say, there's several conflicts. Like the one that I'm I know a, some a little about, but I'm the least expert is this, the long running civil war where I do think there are some really classic, I don't really think as Colombia is special is I think of it as an extreme. I think, it, I think of it as an extreme example of a mix of unchecked interests, intangible incentives and commitment problems in the sense that I think there, I think there were, at the outset, there were ideological reasons that drove the violence to begin. There was an intransigence on both sides to compromise. Uh, once the war got running, however, I think, I think the drug trade um, created a, a source of financing, but also a personal stake in continuing the violence and instability that so the puzzle isn't necessarily why it broke out but why it went on for like five decades with this one particular group and i think you can't separate it from from the drug trade and the fact that that's a constant incentive to keep it going uh but more important the, the really classic example of the commitment problem and why it's hard to end wars is it means the guerrilla have to give up and they have to put down their arms and join a political process and when they do that In part, they relinquish one of their strongest pieces of bargaining power, which are their organized armed groups. And they have to trust that the government is going to not renege on that agreement once they, once they put their arms down. And repeatedly over the last five years, sometimes in the middle of peace talks, the government has used or, or factions or splinter groups, it's not really clear to me, has used that opportunity to try to assassinate leaders and and then after this peace agreement was signed um 
how many hundreds of thousands of leftist leaders have been assassinated in the last few years? And so that commitment problem was real in Colombia. And they were, they, they were correct to be suspicious of the government's ability to commit or, or really just a, their, some, at least some splinter faction of their, their opponents um, to, not, to not use a, a piece to sort of, you know, gain advantage of them over by other means, like these assassinations. So, so that to me is what makes Colombia in some sense, like a, like an icon, like really like an extreme example of, of three of these five forces. Um, but, but the, the, the work I've done in Colombia is, is more looking at the single city and the organized criminal piece, what they call the back to the machine gun in, in Medellin and, and how higher level criminal bands in the city have tried to, they work a little bit like the UN security council. They're kind of unequal and selective in their justice, but they, use a mix of sanctions and bargaining tables and, and resolutions and to sort of solve amidst the amidst the city's 400 warring gangs, they, they sanction you for starting wars and not considering the costs or pursuing an intangible incentive like vengeance or making a mistake and having misperceptions or, and they provide a bargaining table to reduce uncertainty and they hold they provide commitments to deals and they're, they're mediating officially mediating between groups. And so, you know, despite being sort of filled to the top of its green peaks with, you know, hot headed armed young men, Medellin is about half the homicide rate of Chicago, maybe a third or quarter of a place like Cali, much lower than Rio. Like it's a relatively Pacific big city in the Americas. And how does that happen? Like, I mean, basically you're describing the emergence of an institution that regulates this. And well, you mentioned just early how that's like, that seemed to be a problem in Chicago specifically, like people trying to come up with that solution was not feasible. What, what, what are the particularities or what is this a completely idiosyncratic event or? I think that's a good, it's a good question. Um, that's something we're writing on now. And I don't know if we have a full and complete answer. I think there's a, f I think one answer is that these meso level criminal structures and hierarchies do emerge in most cities because criminal groups do need governance. Um, and so you can find them in the United States, both you could find them on the streets 20 years ago before a lot of them were taken out. You can still find them in the prisons. You find them in Rio and Sao Paulo and you find them in El Salvador. So for example, when people talk about the Maras or when people in El Salvador, when people talk about the PCC in Brazil, or when people talk about, I don't know, like a super gang in Chicago, like the black disciples or or the vice lords or something. The, the fact is, is those are the big groups that are like umbrellas over the many smaller street factions. So there's like hundreds of small groups. There's slightly more visible super gangs that are providing a degree of criminal, criminal governance. I think they emerge partly in response to rents and then just the demand for criminal order. I think the question is, when do they become good at actually creating that order because often they're not very successful at being peace. So it's not that these meso organizations don't exist is that they often struggle to find peace themselves. So they fall prey to the five, partly they fall prey to the five problems and they fight amongst themselves. And partly they, um, and, and then partly they just don't have the capacities to be effective peacemakers. And so, so I don't know why that emerges. It's possible. One sort of paradoxical thing is it's possible that it's through the process of fighting and failing to solve the five problems between themselves that they are eventually forced to sort of, they eventually find an equilibrium. It takes them a decade or two, but they find an equilibrium where they're not fighting. And then they find ways to preserve that order. And so it's almost like the, incentives and the capacity take, take some time to develop. And so there's this initial period of disorder before they find order.
um, you know, it's, you know, from an economic history perspective, I think there's a really interesting parallel. To me, one of my favorite papers was written by Jeff Williamson and uh, John Coatsworth and Bob Bates, who are all sort of grand historians of like 19th, 20th century development in Latin America and Africa. Um, and they talk about how decolonization in Latin America in the 19th century was followed by decades of warfare before all these warring countries found a political equilibrium. And, and likewise, decolonization in, in Africa was a change in the political equilibrium. And it took decades of fighting, but things calmed down and f gradually finding a political equilibrium. So I kind of see the same thing. You have the creation of these drug grants and these organizations in Medellin and Rio, and there's decades of fighting, potentially. It takes time to find that political equilibrium and to sort of learn how to build those institutions to stop these sort of five factors from leading you to fight is, is one of the ways I look at it. Let me ask you one final question. And, and so I asked this to all my guests, uh, but um, there's one particular in your case based on your acknowledgement section. So the question usually is why writing a book and a discipline that highly rewards journal articles mostly, right? And considering the fact that writing an article, a, a, a book takes a long time and, and so on. Um, so I want to hear that, what were your motivations, but um, I want to ask you for your decision of writing it now, as in um, the last part of the book, you mentioned that Ross, Rover, Ross Roberts from, uh, from Hoover asked you when you were going to write that book and you said that maybe in 10 years and you felt like, well, 10 years... It's going to be too long, right? And you decided that it was the right moment for doing it now. So, yeah, tell me a bit about that. Like, how was the process and how much, again, it seems that to have been a quite idiosyncratic, like, decision a certain way? Um, yeah, I think, I think you have to, I think mostly to write a book, you have to find it intrinsically rewarding. So I enjoyed the research that went into the book and I enjoyed the act of writing it. A lot of people don't, they find that very painful and it is painful in a way, but I actually really enjoyed the process. So, so one of the reasons when I started, I kept at it because I enjoyed it. We have that luxury. And so even if there aren't the same kind of external rewards in the traditional external rewards in the profession, I, that it, the intrinsic rewards kept me going. Uh, I think there are also external rewards. I think people do deeply appreciate these books. I think um, in development, for example, the existence of like poor economics or a elusive quest for growth or are just really important act works of synthesis that are really useful to academics as well uh, for teaching, but also ourselves for like synthesizing all this evidence in a way. So I think it's a service that is rewarded. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think then there's this elusive reward of like, maybe I actually just reach a lot of people outside my normal circle and you get success as a public intellectual, but more that you just shape mind, right? I think the way you, if you care about changing policy or changing the way the world works, you have to change the general conversation, right? And so, so it's, it's nice. So, so you know, having runaway success with a book, can, you know, feed your ego, but it's also the way to, I think it's the only way that any kind of social change happens through, from intellectuals. It's by changing the conversation. Um, but you can't write a book for that reason because the probability of doing that is so low. Like it, the, there's a handful of books like Why Nations Fail and Freakonomics and that have that kind of runaway success. And, and, and we select on the dependent variable and every, you can convince yourself that that's going to happen to you. And that generally doesn't happen. Like my book by any standard is fairly successful because only because 50% of books that get published fail, like just die on arrival. And so mine is in that middle ground of didn't die, didn't run away success, changing the conversation a little bit, not changing the conversation universally. Um, so didn't, you know, it, that's why I think the intrinsic rewards for you personally and the extrinsic rewards in terms of 
servicing the profession have to be like first and second in your calculus because this elusive third of like, I'm going to be on the bestseller list almost never comes to pass. And everybody who writes a book thinking they're going to have a bestseller and is motivated by that is, regrets it. And the only people who don't regret writing a book are the people who found the other two sort of being their sort of their, their core goals. That's good. I mean, it's great that you decided to write the book. Um, I enjoy it a lot. And I do think that it's very useful. You know, you're dealing with like most, some of the most important problems that uh, society faces. So I'm very glad that you decided to write it now and not in, in 10 years. Um, well, thanks a lot for being here with us. Uh, it was a delightful conversation. Great. No, thanks for having me.